Salutations! There is absolutely no point in watching this video without seeing the previous one, so I won't summarise. Let's begin where we left off. The second chapter begins with a scathing description of Yahweh, which relies heavily on literalistic interpretation, but this interpretation is also taken up by many Abrahamics, and besides, I have no interest in defending Abrahamism. Professor Dawkins then gives us his definition of what he calls the God Hypothesis. There exists a superhuman, supernatural intelligence who deliberately designed and created the universe and everything in it, including us. He further states that, God, in the sense defined, is a delusion, and as later chapters will show, a pernicious delusion. And, well, I agree. God, by this definition, does not exist. What the Professor has given us is the God of the Creationist. He is the watchmaker who hangs the stars in place like baubles and meticulously fashions the lion and the cockroach like a sculptor. Someone may suggest that the Creationist's watchmaker is the same as the Demiurge, but the comparison is superficial. The Demiurge's cosmic construction project is a mythological narrative that represents the superposition of matter and form, which indeed produces the phenomenal world. The god that Dawkins describes is an encosmic being, a creature that exists within the same causal framework as the universe itself and who personally, consciously manipulates matter like an invisible telekinetic man. If a being like this exists, then it is a part of the material universe, not the cause of it. It is subject to form just like the matter it controls. I have heard this concept referred to as theistic personalism, as opposed to classical theism by Catholic speakers, who are very derisive of this conception of God. This God requires explaining in and of himself. He has ontological requirements, since he could not exist without the prior reality of form, which itself could not exist without the prior one itself. How do you get from the one and form to a superpowered creature who is part of the universe, but somehow controls everything else in the universe? This god is foreign and unrecognisable to every major theistic philosopher in Western history, from the Memphite priests to Pythagoras to Thomas Aquinas, to say nothing of the Platonists. Having discovered that the learned professor is proceeding with his analysis on the basis of a straw man, we move on to the subject of polytheism. It is not clear why the change from polytheism to monotheism should be assumed to be a self-evidently progressive improvement. But it widely is, an assumption that provoked Ibn Warraq, author of Why I Am Not a Muslim, wittily to conjecture that monotheism is in turn doomed to subtract one more god and become atheism. With this I broadly agree, though for unrelated reasons. I rather consider the whole process to be a tragic regression from the sacred to the profane. Professor Dawkins then charges headlong into Christian theology, apparently running blindfolded. Rivers of medieval ink, not to mention blood, have been squandered over the mystery of the Trinity, and in suppressing deviations such as the Arian heresy. Arius of Alexandria, in the 4th century AD, denied that Jesus was consubstantial, i.e. of the same substance or essence, with God. What on earth could that possibly mean, you are probably asking? Substance? What substance? What exactly do you mean by essence? Very little seems the only reasonable reply. We have once more been graced with a mesmerising display of ignorance. These terms he thinks are vague are in fact extremely precise, and are used in philosophical discourse with standard definitions that anyone can read. The substance is that quality which renders the subject itself and not something else. Two identical objects possess the same accidents, that is, the same sensible or discernible qualities, and if encountered at different times may be thought by an observer to be the same object but they are distinct from one another in substance. The essence, or osia, refers to the property of being itself in an ontological context. In order to be qualified, something first has to be. Osia refers to the being without referring to its qualities. Dawkins then questions whether Trinitarianism is actually polytheism. For what it's worth, homo oousios is exactly how I as a Platonist would characterise the relationship between the henads, and therefore I cannot help but consider the Trinity in the same way. Unfortunately, the Professor continues to heap accusations of vagueness onto Catholic theology despite the quotes he cites being crystal clear. The veneration of saints and angels is then presented at length, though no argument is attached to it, rendering me greatly confused as to why it is there, but let's continue. We get a clarification for the future chapters pertinent to this reading. For brevity, I shall refer to all deities, whether poly or monotheistic, as simply God. He also mentions some books, including The Golden Bough by James Fraser. 
If Professor Dawkins is getting information on religion from such atrocious sources as that, then it's no wonder he's fallen prey to such opinions. Needless to say, that wretched book will appear on this series eventually. The next section on monotheism begins by talking up the violence of the Abrahamic religion once more. He then produces this ridiculous statement. And I shall not be concerned at all with other religions such as Buddhism or Confucianism. Indeed, there is something to be said for treating these not as religions at all, but as ethical systems or philosophies of life. Why this should be the case for those two religions and not for Christianity or Islam is beyond my comprehension. It may be that Professor Dawkins is so thoroughly unfamiliar with religion that he is not aware of the array of specific supernatural beliefs that are absolutely fundamental to Buddhism, without which the entire system of thought instantly falls apart, including a belief in a plurality of deities and powerful saints. Confucianism also is deeply integrated with cultic practice, including traditional sacrifice to the Chinese gods. After this, we receive a very long tirade about deism, the US Constitution and Founding Fathers, and the use of Christianity in American politics. Anyone who's remotely interested in such topics already knows far more about them than I care to provide, so I will skip it all. Our next subject is agnosticism, which the learned professor divides into two categories. The first kind is a temporary admission that the lack of available evidence prevents an immediate conclusion one way or the other on a given topic. The second kind is a conviction that a given question cannot possibly be answered under any circumstances. Naturally, Professor Dawkins criticises those who would attempt to put the question of God's existence into the second category, and naturally I am inclined to agree, but he then goes further and tries to shoehorn God into the realm of physics. Contrary to Huxley, I shall suggest that the existence of God is a scientific hypothesis like any other. Even if hard to test in practice, it belongs in the same TAP or temporary agnosticism box as the controversies over the Permian and Cretaceous extinctions. God's existence or non-existence is a scientific fact about the universe, discoverable in principle if not in practice. Unfortunately for the learned professor, you don't get to just claim for no reason whatsoever that any given entity belongs in a rigid box that you have defined into existence. This is the equivalent of me declaring that if Professor Dawkins exists, it must be possible to find him by looking inside my wardrobe. Since he isn't... uh, hold on a moment. Since he in fact isn't in my wardrobe, I suppose he must not exist. Modern empiricism, which is what Dawkins means when he says science, is an arbitrary invention of humans that finds success in modern society due to its ability to produce consumer products at an accelerated rate. As the physicist and philosopher of science Paul Feyerabend explains in his book Against Method, the methodological rules that characterise modern empiricism are completely contrary to how real scientific discoveries are actually made, and that developments like heliocentrism could not possibly have developed in an environment framed by these rules. Scientists in fact break these rules constantly and make advances in doing so. Inventing theories and contemplating them in a relaxed and artistic fashion, scientists often make moves that are forbidden by methodological rules. For example, they interpret the evidence so that it fits their fanciful ideas, eliminate difficulties by ad hoc procedures, push them aside or simply refuse to take them seriously. The activities which, according to Fagel, belong to the context of discovery are, therefore, not just different from what empiricist philosophers say about justification, they are in conflict with it. People knew, learned, and discovered things about reality all the time before this method was invented, and the vast majority of those things are still considered correct now. Modern empiricism itself sits on top of a massive framework of non-scientific philosophical inquiry, metaphysical propositions, epistemological axioms, and centuries-old customary traditions, none of which are even possible to investigate empirically. Essentially, the science that Dawkins thinks can account for divinity can't even account for itself. You have to have a philosophical basis that is not empirical, or simply assume that it's all valid with no justification at all. This is perfectly true of Dawkins' own field of expertise, evolutionary biology. Evolutionary theorists in the late 19th century had to live with the knowledge that the best physics of their day insisted that the sun could not possibly have been giving the Earth light and warmth for long enough to allow the evolutionary process that they, and especially Darwinists, hypothesised. In the end, they were vindicated by the discovery that the sun and all the stars were working in quite another, unimagined way. 
Before that discovery, their convictions were founded not on a rationalistic grasp of what must be, nor even a detailed grasp of what biological processes could be involved in merely Darwinian selection, but on the story's power to explain, or gesture at least towards a possible explanation, and inspire. In other words, if Charles Darwin had been following the rules that Richard Dawkins endorses here, he would never have come up with his theory in the first place. Dawkins brings up Russell's teapot and the flying spaghetti monster, both of which are proposed entities that are impossible to empirically disprove. Dawkins, along with Bertrand Russell himself, seem to be of the opinion that this means these entities are impossible to investigate discursively at all, when in fact it's quite easy. A teapot is a man-made object. For a teapot to be in deep space, a man would have had to make it and put it there. Since that hasn't happened, there can't be a teapot there. Spaghetti is a kind of matter. Since matter is contingent, a monster made of spaghetti, whether it flies or not, is also contingent and therefore can't be the first principle of existence and cannot have created the universe. Simple as. No physical evidence is needed to discuss such propositions, and a lack of physical evidence is not an impediment to draw conclusions about them. Therefore, the claim that all propositions with an equal deficiency of physical evidence are equally unbelievable is invalid. Dawkins continues, As I shall argue in a moment, a universe with a creative superintendent would be a very different kind of universe from one without. Why is that not a scientific matter? I don't see on what basis Professor Dawkins feels he is capable of making such a claim from an empirical standpoint. So far as he is aware, nobody has ever observed an example of a universe with a creative superintendent, and therefore it is completely impossible to scientifically determine what one would or wouldn't look like. Such a determination could very easily be made on the basis of abstract reason, but it wouldn't be empirical. So to make such a determination is to admit that what Dawkins calls science is not the only way to verify propositions. The learned professor then proceeds to make his determination on the basis of abstract reason, destroying the entire foundation of his position in the process, and for no benefit whatsoever, because his conclusion isn't even right. Dawkins concludes that these two universes would necessarily look different because God could change things at any time. This presupposes for no reason that God would want to make a universe that's inconsistent, that God intervenes in the universe instead of just watching or making more universes, and that God makes decisions arbitrarily rather than according to a method or standard. That's a lot of baseless assumptions. To lend false weight to his self-destructive assertion, Professor Dawkins tries to attach the historical claims about the miracles attributed to Jesus to the question of a governing intelligence. These are two completely separate claims that have no bearing on one another. One can be true and the other false. One is historical and the other metaphysical. The learned professor goes on at length about one specific scientific study on the effectiveness of Christian prayers, which I've also mentioned in my metaphysics series. He makes zero mentions of the various studies into other paranormal phenomena that have produced positive and statistically significant results in laboratories. He then goes on a long rant about Americans that's not relevant to the question of theism, but exists purely to muddy the waters by pulling in irrelevant images of ignorant, Bible-thumping rednecks out in the Appalachians. For the record, I think such people are quite based. During the final irrelevant rant of the chapter, in which he continues to take random opportunities to be as insulting as possible to theologians, Dawkins considers aliens and asks what would distinguish super-advanced aliens from gods according to Clark's law. Now, if you ask a Mormon, he might have a hard time answering, but anyone who's taken a serious glance at any genuine theological tradition can tell you that a god is not in any way comparable to a physical animal in any way other than symbolically. Even if these aliens have technology capable of reshaping stars and planets, they only have power over physical bodies, which is the tiniest fraction of the power of the gods. Even if they have technology that keeps their bodies young indefinitely, they are still inherently mortal and their bodies inherently perishable. When the universe gives way to entropy, they will die. Like the square protagonist of Flatland, Dawkins is arguing about circles when everyone else is talking about spheres. Well, anyway, that's all I've got time for today. Thanks for watching and have a nice day. But, you know, Redditors, what do you expect from Redditors?